in the form of amendments to the pending FAA reauthorization bill. The Senate has come in. They're in a quorum call. We're going to take you back inside the Senate chamber now, live here on C-SPAN 2.
Madam President. The Senator from West Virginia is recognized and we are in a quorum call. We are in a quorum call. I ask unanimous consent that the order of the quorum call be rescinded. Without objection, so ordered. I thank the presiding officer. Um, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to a period of debate only on the FAA author reauthor authorization bill for the purpose of opening remarks from the chairman, that being me, and ranking member, that being Senator Hutchinson, um, of the Commerce Committee. Without objection, so ordered. I thank you. the presiding officer again. I, uh, I want to thank the majority leader for bringing this bill to the floor so promptly. The first bill of this year, 112th Congress. Air Transportation Modernization and Safety Improvement Act. It reauthorizes the Federal Aviation Act. It has been postponed 15 times over the last four years to the consternation of all of us who uh, care about this subject. We have three Commerce Committee members in the, in the chamber right now, and we're all frustrated about getting it done. So it is the first piece of legislation. So that the bill that I introduced that we are considering is the text of the FAA reauthorization bill that was approved by the whole Senate last year by a vote of 93 to nothing. And all of the matters of safety and, and um, air traffic control systems and all the rest of it that we talk about are all incorporated already in this bill. Although the Senate and the House of Representatives informally conferenced, uh, it was not uh, productive and we were unable to come to a final resolution. So here we are once again. I thought uh, beginning this year's consideration of the FAA reauthorization bill with the legislation that did pass unanimously last year would signal a commitment to bringing forward a bill that had broad bipartisan support at least last year. It wasn't that long ago. There's some new members. Some issues still stand out. We didn't resolve all of them. I do want to say at the beginning that this is a monumentally important bill. I also want to say that I recognize without rancor that there are a lot of members of the Congress that don't really keep up with aviation because they kind of take it for granted and it's highly technical and uh, not always interesting, but always important. Always important. And it, it, uh, it employs 11 million people just for a start. That's only direct employment, not indirect employment. And, um, you know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a vastly important bill, and we're vastly behind where we should be, and this bill will help us move forward. So I want to thank particularly Senator Hutchinson, the ranking member of the Commerce Committee and my able partner, for her efforts on this bill last year. I look forward to working with her again this year on passing this bill, as I know she wants to have happen, and getting it enacted into law. She and I can't sign it into law, but we just want to have it signed into law. A good bill. I believe this bill reflects a shared vision and our mutual goal of making sure that the United States continues to have the safest, most efficient, and most modern aviation system possible. Given the importance of the airline industry to our nation's economy, and again, many people take this for granted, but it's, um, it's a vast industry, uh, I can't think of a more important piece of legislation to our nation's long-term economic uh, competitiveness. It's the right bill to start with. We know this legislation will create and support good-paying American jobs. It already does. 11 million is a lot of jobs. Um, that's slightly more than the population of West Virginia. And that doesn't include the indirect jobs, which are, again, a couple more million, which come directly from this industry and its activities. The bill improves the safety and efficiency of our nation's aviation system by preventing something called runway incursions, which people often aren't aware of unless their plane runs into another on the tarmac, which happens infrequently, but does happen. And, but people would be shocked to know how often and how many times incursions are just about to happen until they're rescued by an understaffed uh, control tower, which says, hey, head right, head left, stop, whatever. So it also modernizes our air traffic control system. That's an easy phrase, modernizes our air traffic control system. It's a vast new concept. 
Uh, we have, we're living in an x-ray age when everybody else is GPS and digitalized. And I include Mongolia. I just like to include Mongolia because the thought of Mongolia being ahead of us is deeply disturbing to me. And uh, it's a way of making a point. I think one would agree. Uh, I want to reduce delays that frustrate flyers, and we do that. It opens the door to greater economic development, especially in rural and underserved areas. It make a, makes a very big point of that through the essential air service and air, airport improvement program and other programs. Simply put, this bill helps protect our position as the global leader in aviation. Now, I said global leader. We are. We are. The aviation needs and goals of Texas and West Virginia are the same. People might not believe it, but they are. My good friend, Senator Hutchins, represents some of the largest airports in the country. I represent some of the finest, smaller airports in the nation. But all of our airports are critical economic engines to their respective communities. Um, she may have, Senator Hutchinson may have more flights in and out of Texas than we have in West Virginia. In fact, I guarantee you she does. But we both know the importance of air service to economic growth and global competitiveness. Every one of our constituents wants the safest aviation system possible. Before assuming our current role, Senator Hutchinson and I rotated, being chairman and ranking member of the Aviation Subcommittee. And we did that for 10 years. So we're pretty heavily into this subject. And uh, we agreed on virtually everything. Virtually everything. But we share a passion for aviation because we know how critical this industry is to our economy, to the comfort and mobility of our people, and to our nation's future. We both share a strong desire to get this legislation enacted into law. I've already said that. It's been far too long, four years, since the last FAA reauthorization bill was enacted. Our nation cannot afford to wait one second longer. Now, sadly, when many people think of flying, their first reaction is often negative. And that's usually what you hear. People complaining in TSA lines, people complaining about delays, people complaining about weather, airlines are meant to control weather, actually they don't, statutorily or otherwise. But people are not happy. Um, and so there's sort of a grumpiness about this subject, uh, which we don't address, but we try to take away the causes of grumpiness. I will be the first to admit, from my own point of view, that travel is not always enjoyable by air. That's a symptom of a number of expectations that we have somehow developed over the years. Air travel has changed with deregulation. Oh, how well I remember deregulation. American big jets at Charleston, West Virginia, United Airlines big jets at Charleston, West Virginia, Eastern Airlines big jets at Charleston, West Virginia, deregulation one month later, no more jets. And we subsist basically on prop planes with two propellers. And if you're my height, uh, it takes an hour or so for, to restore, restore your blood flow uh, after you get out of those, uh, if you're lucky enough to get an exit seat. If you're not, it may take two or three hours. So anyway, um, some of the changes with deregulation have been for the better. Uh, not all those changes have been for the best. Well, there have been frustrating changes for travelers as the industry has adapted to this new reality. There have been many other benefits, primarily cheaper tickets to more places for the average flyer. We must also remember that aviation is more than just a commercial air travel service. Aviation counts for one trillion plus dollars worth of economic activity for the country and again supports more than 11 million jobs directly and many many more indirectly it is a critical sector of our economy boeing is the nation's largest exporter and aerospace sales from large and small producers provide tens of billions madam president of dollars towards balanced trade for the United States with international buyers. This is our last great success story. But we have been tending to it. That's why we're doing this bill now. So in 2010, 
uh, the United States did not have a single commercial aviation fatality. That is a truly remarkable statistic. It is one that we should not only be thankful for, but very proud of. Safety is the number one priority of the Federal Aviation Administration, the airline industry, and the people who work for both. And it is Senator Hutchinson's in mind, uh, the Commerce Committee's number one priority, always is, has to be. It is through hard and dedicated work of the thousands of FAA and airline industry employees that we do, in fact, have the safest uh, aviation system in the world. Improving the safety of our aviation system has been a huge priority for all of us. Uh, you can't rest on your laurels in aviation in any respect. The industry is always shaky. The public is always shaky, uh, so a little bit uh, shaky. Um, times are shaky. Bad times, fewer passengers. Better times, more passengers. Sounds like good news for better passengers, but I'm coming to that. It isn't necessarily good news that there'll be more passengers in the future. I strongly believe that this bill is fundamentally about the future of aviation, and it is vastly important. This bill is about making sure that we have the most technologically advanced satellite-based air traffic control system in the world. This bill is about catapulting our air traffic control system out of the 19th century and into the 21st century with every other industrialized country in the world. We do not share that with them now. X-ray is, is an X-ray. More people drive around in cars uh, with uh, global GPS systems than airplanes have. So it doesn't make sense, but that's the fact. Uh, today, as I said, we're behind Europe and even Mongolia, and we have to remedy that fact and we have to do it quickly. So this bill is about making sure that we continue to have the most dynamic aviation industry in the world. And I'll say it again. The U.S. civil, civil aviation sector generates $1 trillion a year in economic activity and employs 11 million people. All of that activity creates jobs in every sector of our economy. Airport construction jobs, building airplanes from the smallest general aviation to Boeing state-of-the-art 787 Dreamliner. All create jobs, jobs at airlines, jobs in general, avi general aviation, like the small airports that dot both Senator Hutchinson's and my uh, state, the rural parts thereof, and the presiding officers. And those, as I say, are just the direct jobs Airports and the aviation industry support millions of indirect jobs. That makes sense. One only need to look, and this is sort of the most obvious presentation of it, to look at the growth around Dulles, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Denver International. Denver International is built out in the middle of desert. Not anymore. Um, I don't think Dallas-Fort Worth was ever out in the middle of the desert, but it's, just, it's grown, I mean, it's extraordinary, the growth. It attracts jobs. People don't want to bicycle to Dallas or to Charleston or anywhere else. They want to go by air. Business decisions are made by air. So, um, so that point speaks for itself. In Beckley, West Virginia, which is not huge, but has a wonderful airport, what's interesting is that it also has an enormously successful business park at that facility. Our major airports in Charleston and Huntington have direct flights to the major headquarters of chemical and energy companies that allow businesses to grow in West Virginia. I believe that the future of the U.S. aviation system has unlimited potential. We face serious challenges in making sure we reach that potential, but I know that we are up to it. To make it work, we have to upgrade our 1950s-era antiquated air traffic control system. Investing in technology and infrastructure is a very good place to start. It's embarrassing that some of our newer cars, as I indicated, have more sophisticated global positioning systems than many of our aircraft in the skies. That has to change. It costs money. It's everything to do with lives and safety. And um, we... we and it's going to get much bigger, many more passengers. Uh, we have 750 million people flying every year now. 
Uh, in another few years, it'll be one billion. So it's almost like a 50% increase in the number of people flying. Everything gets more complicated. Everything gets more crowded. It's eye-opening to see the speed with which China and other developing nations are investing in their air traffic control systems in their airports. They know what they're doing. They take nothing for granted. Growth is on their minds. Again, we just have to make the effort now to get ahead or we will be left far behind. And I'm sorry, but that's the way it works. It's not a sentimental industry. It's one that needs to be treated well, nurtured, and supported. So if we don't act quickly, we're at risk for falling behind global competitors. We'll lose the cargo hubs, the air aircraft manufacturing plants, and the economic development that aviation causes. I cannot understate, Madam President, the importance of a vibrant and strong aviation system. And I've made no attempt, I think, to be shy on that account. Can't be. It's fundamental to our nation's long-term economic growth. It's fundamental to my state's ability to attract new investment. When choosing to invest in an area, the quality of air service is the prime consideration. I say the, you could say A, I say the. Um, you can have a great quality of life, that's good, but it doesn't get you a factory. Quality of life is good, but it isn't preemptive. The ability to fly one stop from West Virginia to almost any corner of the world, which we now have, is critical for our ability to attract new businesses and jobs. Why do we have 20 Japanese companies in West Virginia? I mean, that's a actually cerebrally interesting question. The reason is because we have good air service and we have good workers. But if you had good workers and no particularly good air service, we wouldn't have them. Now, you have a lot more than that in Texas, but for West Virginia, that's a phenomenal uh, statistic. All of our futures are tied to modern aviation systems. Over the last several years, we have focused more on the inconveniences of air travel rather than trying to sol solve the underlying problems that make air travel so challenging. Most Americans do not understand how fragile our air transportation system really is. The economic downturn of the last several years masked this fragility because fewer people flew, so there was less pressure on the system. But as our economy recovers, uh, I'm afraid that the inherent weakness of our system will loom larger than ever uh, in years to come as we get to a billion passengers a year. The possibility of a meltdown of the air traffic control system may become reality unless we modernize it. And this will create more inconvenience. It will put passenger safety at very substantial risk. These are not the only troubling signs. As I noted, there was no commercial aviation fatalities in 2010, but that doesn't mean the system is working to perfection. We were lucky, and people worked hard. Over the last few years, the FAA and the industry have faced serious questions over their commitment to safety. That commitment has been called into question. The grounding of thousands of aircraft throughout the system in 2008 raised questions about the quality of, of airline maintenance practices and the FAA's ability to provide sufficient oversight of air carriers and their maintenance, not just domestic, but also overseas. Another subject. The tragic accident downing of uh, Flight 3407 on the snowy night in Buffalo exposed problems with pilot training, flight crew fatigue, particularly pilot fatigue, and the ability of the industry to assure the traveling public that there is only one level of safety throughout the entire system. This bill addresses that through a number of stipulations, but they're just you know, we're, we're making it a rule. We have to get this into law. FAA is putting some of this into practice, but we have to make it into law. People have to get enough sleep. Uh, they can talk above 10,000 feet about something other than aviation, but below 10,000 feet where the crowd really gathers and the aviation uh, is being scrutinized by air traffic control folks, you have to have what is called a sterile cockpit 
Nobody talks about anything but landing. Anything but landing. So, I'm deeply proud of the reforms that we've put into place in the area of safety, and they offer even more incentive to pass the bill quickly. Before I close, sort of, I want to recognize the efforts of former Senator Byron Dorgan, and I think Senator Hutchinson would join me in that for his incredibly hard work on behalf of this safety issue. I'm pleased to say that the FAA is currently working on implementing the two, two dozen provisions of the law that he helped with others to create. I feel very strongly uh, improving our aviation system is a national priority. My passion comes from a deep belief that our future is tied to a healthy aviation industry. America is the cradle of aviation. I don't want to see that change. Since 1988, I have worked diligently as the chairman of the Aviation Subcommittee and now as chairman of the Commerce Committee to support our aviation system and to address its challenges, to wit, inadequate funding for the FAA, a chronically unprofitable commercial aviation industry, and minimal investment in aerospace research. Nobody moves forward in industry without doing research. We just won't pay for it. And so a lot of it isn't done. In some areas, we've made progress. We have increased our investment in airport infrastructure. We've opened up new markets for U.S. carriers. And, and thanks to the administration, we've finally begun to make serious investments in modernizing our air traffic control system. It's a multi-year process, highly expensive. I know many of my colleagues will say that we cannot afford to make those investments in aviation at this time. But now, it seems to me, is the precise time to make them. The recession prevented widespread delays from occurring, so we were lulled into thinking everything was going well. Over the last two years, airlines dramatically cut capacity, parked hundreds of planes in the desert. We don't have deserts in West Virginia, and I don't know where they're parked, but somewhere in a desert there are hundreds of planes which were just taken offline because of lack of passenger demand. Anyway, we can't make short-sighted budget decisions the cost of action will be far greater. Our economy, and I, I want to ask my colleague from, uh, from Texas. I'm proceeding well, but I'm not finished. Is that acceptable? Absolutely. You're my colleague says it's absolutely acceptable. Thank you. Our economy, yes, has begun to slowly turn around. And the demand for air travel has slowly begun to grow. Airlines have cautiously increased capacity. If we act now, we can be prepared to meet the challenges of adding 300 million passengers to the system in the next decade. If we fail to act, congestion will plague the system again, delays will be a fact of life, and today will look like the golden age of travel. Okay, a word on modernization. The benefits of investing in air traffic control modernization extend far beyond the ability to handle more passengers. Most importantly, the next generation air transportation system, we call it next gen, will dramatically improve the safety of our air transportation system by providing pilots and air traffic controllers with better situational awareness. Now, you can't tell if there's a mountain in front of you. You can't tell about the ground situation. You can't tell very well about separation. It's inefficient. Planes land, but they could land more quickly. You can't read as efficiently as you should the distance between, in the altitude between one level of plane flying in for a landing or taking off from a landing and another one. So it's inefficient. It's dangerous, in fact. So we have to do this. We have to be able to see other aircraft in detailed weather maps in real time. To be able to go from one place to another in a straight shot, that's what NextGen will do for us. Now planes are going all over the place, avoiding this, avoiding that, uh, as they go from one TRACON to another TRACON, a weather system, an unexpected flight, whatever. Uh, GPS, NextGen, will allow for straight flight. That does interesting things. It saves, a lot, it saves a lot of fuel, and it saves a lot of time. And delays cost the American economy about $33 billion a year. So um, we've got to provide our pilots and our air traffic controllers with better situational awareness. 
it, they will be able to see other aircraft in detailed weather maps, and that becomes important. A new satellite-based ATC air traffic control system will allow airplanes to move more efficiently by, as I said, taking more direct routes, which saves our economy billions of dollars on an annual basis. Greater operational efficiency will also create substantial environmental benefits. Drastic reduction in fuel consumption um, means not only that we will achieve lower carbon emissions, fewer of them will be spewed out, but almost every community near an airport will benefit greatly from this effort. Also, planes are becoming quieter. In all ways, they're getting to be better, but we still have to guide them correctly. I note that the President uh, clearly recognizes the value of of investing in our air transportation system, and this was reflected in his budget request. The administration proposed a total of $1.1 billion in FY 2011 uh, for next-gen programs, which is more than a 30 percent increase from the fiscal year 2010. Is that bad in this time and age of uh, skepticism about budgets? I hope that we can continue this level of budget, even in lean budget years. Modernizing the AT system, ATC system will require a sustained focus and substantial resources. This legislation takes concrete steps to make sure that FAA accelerates key next-gen programs, puts on targets, programs, how many to be done by 2014, how many airports, how many by 2018. It's laid out in the bill. So let me discuss a few of the key measures in 2003 that further address modernization. To improve accountability, this bill establishes an air traffic modernization board, designates a, a chief next-gen officer to provide specific oversight of the FAA's modernization activities. Oversight is what the Congress is really for, and we don't do it well enough because we all are on too many committees and have too much work to do. So, Putting somebody in who's responsible for oversighting next-gen within FAA is not a silly idea, it's a good idea. The bill also establishes specific deadlines for the implementation of the next-gen programs. It's got fancy names, which I won't tax you with. Area Navigation, read RNAV, and Required Navigational Performance, read RNP, procedures must be developed at the nation's largest 30 airports by 2014. Where these technologies are already in place, we're seeing dramatic benefits in reduced fuel consumption and many other benefits. All aircraft are required to be equipped with automatic dependent surveillance uh, broadcast. I won't bore you with that, but that's what it's about. ADS-B is the cornerstone of the FAA's air traffic control modernization effort. It provides controllers and pilots with an aircraft's immediate position. Pilots will be able to see the real-time position of other aircraft and receive the same information that controllers are receiving in their towers, but they'll see them in their cockpit. The FAA estimates next gen will cost probably about $20 billion through 2025, and the airlines another $20 billion in aircraft uh, equipage. In other words, they have to match, the airlines have to match to a certain extent what the federal government is doing. And they, they will do that. Again, some will argue that we can't afford this investment. I would say it's the other way around. This bill is paid for. It makes a substantial commitment to providing the FAA with the resources it needs. I've worked with Senators Inouye and Baucus to reach a deal that I, I shouldn't say that, reach an agreement that um, moves us in the direction. S-223 will create a new modernization efforts. This modernization subcount account will dedicate $400 annually to next-gen efforts and to nothing else. So it's just boxed right in. And our colleagues have worked hard on all of this. A word on small community air service. That's another core challenge. Uh, every part of my state is basically rural in West Virginia. 
and every part of most states, every state has some rural parts. Everybody thinks of LaGuardia, JFK, et cetera, but try upper, upper of state in New York. Try around the Saranax or north of that, into the Buffaloes and other, they're dealing with small aircraft. That's where the crash took place, small aircraft in Buffalo. Pilot was drowsy. So this continuing crisis has hit the U.S. airline industry very hard. And because it affects, you see, rural communities are at the end of the food chain. If something bad happens at the top of the food chain, there, there will be some suffering. But the real suffering takes place at the bottom of the food chain. That's where the, the flights get cut off. That's where they get eliminated. That's where they suddenly stop not going to places or stop going to places. So let's hope for better times, but we don't have them yet. And so we're in crisis. Uh, the reduction or elimination of air service has a devastating effect on the economy of a community, thereby. I stipulate that from the previous sentence. Having adequate air service is not just a matter of convenience, but also a matter of economic survival. Without access to reliable air service, no business is going to locate their operations, and I've already talked about that. But small airlines, small airports are important. When Congress deregulated the airline industry in 1978, we made a promise to small communities, an official promise, that they would continue to have access to the nation's air transportation system. I believe that the federal government needs to provide additional resources and tools for small communities to help themselves attract adequate air service. This legislation does this by building on existing programs. Authorized funding for the essential air service program is increased to $200 million annually. The EAS program is critical to dozens of communities throughout our country, I've made that point, and it's an increase uh, from the previous amount. It's needed. It also provides a lot of flexibility to EAS, what people, small airports can do with EAS. Somebody may be phasing out of being a commercial EAS airport, and they're headed towards being a um, General Aviation Airport. Well, this allows that transition uh, to move forward. Almost at the end here. Consumer protection. That's key. We're about protecting lives, protecting people, protecting passengers. The bill strengthens passenger protection by incorporating elements of the Passenger Bill of Rights which came right out of the Commerce Committee to deal with the most egregious flight delays and cancellations. Talk about angry travelers. This is where you run into them. The industry would be required to take some basic steps to improve the passenger experience. To wit, passengers must be provided with information regarding on-time arrivals and chronically delayed flights when they purchase tickets. Most of them will do that online, so the airlines have to publish what is their record on, on, on time takeoffs or on time landings? What is their delay? What is their cancellation? That has to be posted so that uh, flyers who want to purchase tickets can compare um, and go elsewhere if they want. Air carriers are also required to permit passengers to deplane after three hours have elapsed. We've all heard about nine hour waits on the tarmac. It's usually not as dramatic as that, but you know, if you're a a mother and you have three children, uh, three hours not moving is a long time. Three hours moving is a long time, but not moving is a very long time. So they would have, after three hours, the right to deplane. It's not mandated. It's just their right to deplane. Airlines can't stop that unless the pilot has a certain belief about they're just about to take off. They have to be given water, they have to be given food, they have to be given medical attention if they need it, bathroom facilities and the rest of it. Now the DOT, Department of Transportation, has taken steps to improve customer protections and I applaud their act actions, but I for one believe that statutory protections are better than um, when a government agency decides to do it. So in conclusion, when we began work on this bill, I at least had four simple goals. One, take steps to address critical safety concerns. Two, reestablish or establish a roadmap for the implement implementation of next gen 
and to accelerate the FAA's key modernization programs. Three, make certain we adequately invest in airport infrastructure. And four, continue to improve small communities' access to the nation's aviation system. This bill takes those steps. And um, I feel very strongly about the bill. Uh, the airport improvement program, which is a part of all of this, is estimated to provide at least 120,000 jobs annually. That's now an $8.1 billion uh, authorized amount. Uh, moving forward, the next gen will certainly help us keep our position as a global leader. So this is the culmination of more than four years of work with Senator Hutchinson, myself, and the hardworking members of the Commerce Committee. Again, this language passed 93 to nothing less than 12 months ago. It's an important bill, important for the safety of the traveling public, important to our ability to create jobs, important to sustaining an aer aerospace industry, important to having healthy airlines, important to general aviation's future, and important to our competitiveness. I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I welcome their ideas about how we might improve it. I ask for you to join me in my determination to complete our work and reauthorize FAA. Mr. President. Senator from Texas. Mr. President, uh, as ranking member of the C Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, uh, I too would like to discuss the FAA reauthorization bill and agree with the chairman, Senator Rockefeller, who has just spoken, that we have worked in a bipartisan way on this bill for four years, and I am glad that he mentioned Senator Dorgan, who was the chairman of the subcommittee, who pushed so hard last year uh, for us to come to a conclusion and try to pass a permanent bill. Uh, the bill that is before us is the bill that passed last year, and there are many good things in this bill. It passed unanimously in the Senate, and we were on our way to conference with the House. Uh, but the House bill was quite different, and uh, we never got to the point of really being able to work out the differences. Um, I do think that there was one part of the bill, which I will discuss more later, uh, that we worked on a compromise uh, to achieve um, a goal of easing the perimeter rule at Washington's National Airport, Reagan Airport, um, and we were not able, we, we were able to come to an agreement among the leaders on the committee, but we were not able to get the full agreement of the Senate, and that was uh, a, an, a gentleman's agreement, if you will, uh, that we would work on putting that into the conference report, uh, but that never came to pass. The perimeter rule is uh, the rule around national airport that has slot restrictions and mileage uh, restrictions on how far you can go directly in and out of national airport uh, from. The perimeter rule prohibits flights traveling to or from points that are more than 1,250 miles from National Airport unless there is an exemption. Many Western states would like more of those exemptions, especially given that the airport can now handle additional capacity. I want to be clear on the on, at the onset of this process. I cannot support a final bill that doesn't address this issue. We need to work out uh, either a consensus majority or an agreement um, that addresses the issue rather than just leaving it out. The FAA has operated under a series of short-term extensions since 2007. Eighteen short-term extensions have occurred. That is not providing the policy that is keeping us in the forefront of modernization of our air traffic system. We need to have a bipartisan, common sense, multi-year FAA reauthorization uh, to provide the stability that this agency, the FAA, and its stakeholders, our airlines and passengers, uh, need to make sound investment decisions for our future aviation system. The current short-term extension ex expires March 31st. If we address these issues in our Senate bill, 
I believe that we can work with the House that has already begun to formulate the basis of its bill and have a true reauthorization bill, multi-year, uh, that would be able to pass on March 31st instead of yet another short-term extension. The House version last year was quite different from our bill, and while I, um, a year now has almost elapsed, uh, many of the bill provisions need to be updated. The one that we have before us would modernize the air traffic control system, next gen, which was mentioned by Senator Rockefeller. It would improve aviation safety, and it would assure uh, passengers are treated well, uh, especially if they are delayed and stuck in uh, an aircraft for more than three hours. I call it the captive passenger rule that we need to enact. First, modernization. Probably the most important area that we address in this bill is expediting the FAA's air traffic control modernization program known as NextGen. The FAA operates the largest and safest air traffic control system in the world. In fact, the, air, the FAA's air traffic control system handles almost half of the world's air traffic activity. The U.S. has been a leader in developing and implementing new technologies to create a safer and more efficient airspace system. However, today's air traffic control system is not much different from that that was started in the 1960s. The system is based on radar tracking and ground-based infrastructure. NextGen will move uh, much of the air traffic control infrastructure from ground-based to satellite-based by replacing antiquated, costly ground infrastructure with orbiting satellites and onboard automation. By doing this, the FAA will be able to make our aviation system more safe and efficient while increasing capacity at our nation's busiest airports. Some of the modernization provisions in the bill include establishing clear deadlines for the adoption of existing global positioning system navigation technology. It mandates 100% coverage at the top 35 airports by 2014 with the entire national airspace system to be required to be covered by 2018. Aviation safety, Mr. President. As a former vice chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, I understand well the critical and difficult mission the FAA has in overseeing our nation's airlines and aviation system. Aviation safety and the public trust that go along with it are the bedrock of our national aviation policy, and we simply cannot allow any degradation of safety for the flying public. This bill goes a long way to advance and promote the air travel system. Last August, as part of one of the short-term extensions, several of the important safety provisions were enacted into law that were the direct result of weaknesses identified from the tragic crash and aftermath of Colgan, Colgan Flight 3407 in Buffalo, New York. While those provisions were of great importance and will have an impact on creating one level of safety through all sectors of aviation, we still have important work to do, and in this bill, we do it. Addressing inconsistent application of airworthiness directives by improving the voluntary disclosure reporting process to ensure adequate actions are taken in response to reports. Limiting the ability of FAA administrators to work with air carriers Ms. over President, which they have had Ms. oversight. President, would, would my friend will the uh, senator yield? Uh, Mr. President, I will be happy to yield if the uh, leaders would allow me to come in when they are finished sure. and uh, continue as if uninterrupted. Ms. President, is there I, objection? I appreciate her courtesy. The, the, uh, the leader I is. I have a consent agreement. Ms. President, I ask consent that Senator Stabenow be recognized to offer an amendment relating to 1099 reporting forms that she will give her speech regarding this after. Senator McConnell offers an amendment relating to health care, and the amendments be debated concurrently. And prior, Senator um, McConnell can do 
whatever he feels appropriate. But he will speak before Senator Stabenow. And uh, how much more time do you have to speak? Uh, probably about uh, five or six minutes. Okay, so you, whatever you and Senator McConnell decide on that is fine with me. So I could speak after Senator McConnell and before Senator Stabenow? I would say to my friend from Texas, my statement is really pretty brief. If, if she wouldn't mind, uh, I think Senator Stabenow is willing to let me uh, do mine and lay down my amendment and then... Uh, Senator Stabenow would be willing to let you finish your statement before she does. So I, I ask Senator Stabenow to be recognized to offer the amendment and then Senator McConnell would offer his. Under the other... Without objection. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk, amendment number nine. I would ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. The senator from Michigan, Ms. Stabenow, proposes the president, amendment I would ask number the clerk nine. Dispense with the reading. Without objection. Thank you. The Republican leader. Mr. President, I thank the senator from Texas very much for letting me make a brief statement about the amendment I'm about to offer. And... Um, apologize for interrupting her um, comments. M Mr. President, what we have today is an opportunity, an opportunity for the majority to reevaluate what it has done on the issue of health care and take another path. It's no secret the American people don't like the health care bill that was passed last year. And if you've talked with doctors or nurses or anybody else involved in health care over the last year, most of them will tell you they don't like it either. Employers, big and small, have been desperately trying to get the message across of how damaging this bill will be to their ability to create jobs. They tell us the impact of the bill is severe. Higher taxes, penalties for hiring workers, new regulations that already run to more than 6,000 pages, mountains of new paperwork, all this at a time when businesses want to create jobs and millions of Americans are looking for one. Don't take it from me. Here's how the National Federation of Independent Businesses puts it. Small business owners everywhere, the NFIB has said, are rightfully concerned that the unconstitutional new mandates, countless rules and new taxes in the health care law, will devastate their businesses and their ability to create jobs. And now yesterday, a federal court in Florida found the crux of the law to be unconstitutional. So we have an opportunity today, an opportunity. For all those who supported the health law, it's an opportunity to reevaluate your vote, to listen to your constituents who are desperately trying to get your attention. You can say, perhaps this was a mistake. We can do this better. Or you can continue to dismiss the majority of the people in this country as not knowing what they're talking about. It's not every day that you get a second chance on a big decision after you know all the facts. Today is one of those days. For all of us who oppose the health care bill, today we reaffirm our commitment to work a little harder to get it right. We can't afford to get it wrong. So I urge my colleagues to move beyond party affiliation. Just look at the facts before us. If everyone in this chamber evaluated this bill for what it is, we'd repeal it right now. And then we'd begin to work on achieving our mutual goal of delivering health care at a higher quality for lower costs. Let's not miss this opportunity. Mr. President, I send the amendment to the desk and I ask its immediate uh, consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. The senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell, proposes an amendment number 13. And I thank the senator from Texas and I yield the floor. Senator from Texas. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm pleased that we are starting on the FAA bill and uh, having open amendment uh, process so that uh, everyone can be heard. I will finish uh, my remarks as the ranking member of the Commerce Committee and then uh, I know Senator Stabenow wants to speak on the uh, First Amendment that's going to be offered. It is probably unrelated to our FAA bill but nevertheless uh, very important for our country. Uh, let me go back to where I was on uh, the parts of the FAA reauthorization bill that address aviation safety. Uh, we do limit the ability of FAA 
inspectors to work for air carriers over which they have had oversight, and we will require conducting independent reviews of safety issues identified by employees. Requiring enhanced safety oversight of foreign repair stations, including a minimum of two FAA inspections annually, with exceptions for those that have comprehensive bilateral aviation safety maintenance agreements with the United States. Our bill would also require alcohol and drug testing at any foreign facilities that perform maintenance on U.S. commercial aircraft. Finally, the bill also provides infrastructure investment to our nation's airports. As we all know, you can have the best planes and the best air traffic system, but they mean nothing without the proper airport infrastructure in place. Mr. President, this bill contains many important provisions and deserves the support of the Senate. We have been operating under short-term extensions for far too long. It is also one of the reasons we need to finally address the D.C. perimeter rule, which has impeded the passage of this bill on too many occasions. While I have been talking about what is in the bill, this is the one issue that is currently not included in the bill and must be addressed if we are to have a successful final passage. After months of negotiation last year, the chairman, the subcommittee chairman, Western senators, and I and our ranking member on the subcommittee reached a compromise agreement that we hoped would finally resolve the issue. But we didn't have an opportunity to bring the consensus version to the floor before we adjourned. It is a very reasonable approach. Here are the provisions of the compromise. It would add five new round-trip flights beyond the perimeter for new entrants or limited incumbents, which mean airlines that have very small bases at National Airport now, meaning we would add competition with the five new round-trip flights. It allows for conversion of 16 round-trip flights from large hub airports inside the perimeter to any airport outside the perimeter phased in over two years. The conversion concept, concept seeks to address congestion concerns by replacing existing flights rather than creating more new flights. Since 2000, there have only been 12 new flights in national airports since the year 2000. Now we are asking for five more new flights, which would increase competition, and the conversion flights, which would have no impact on the congestion in the airport because they will not be new flights. It prohibits the use of wide-body aircraft for converted flights to address any noise concerns from local residents. But in reality, the noise issue is so different today than it was when the first aviation uh, authorization was passed. We have stage three aircraft now, which are much quieter than the uh, planes that have gone in and out of the past. And not to allow the use of bigger aircraft, I think, really protects the residents that might live around the airport. And in fact, I would argue gives them an added convenience because those residents would also have access to the long haul flights uh, at a convenient airport to them. The DOT would evaluate the proposed flights and be able to disapprove of the conversions if they determine they are not in the public interest. The air carriers could only convert flights currently used to operate flights to large hubs within the perimeter in an effort to protect small communities. So in other words, you would not see conversions from very small airports uh, to be able to take long haul flights away. It would only be conversions from a big hub airport to another big hub airport. So our small communities uh, should not feel threatened by this. Carriers would be prohibited from selling, trading, leasing, or otherwise transferring the rights to fly beyond the perimeter. It also eliminates financial restrictions in place between National and Dulles that would allow for revenue sharing between the two airports, which is comparable to other airport systems across the country to address any financial impact on the airport authority. Mr. President, I lived through, dealt with, and negotiated the Wright Amendment in Texas 
and the lifting of the Wright Amendment that allowed a, um, in, an incremental easing of the Wright Amendment restrictions at Dallas Love Field that was put in place to protect DFW Airport when it was first built. That was much of the reason for the restrictions at National Airport when Dulles Airport was built to assure that Dulles would be financially secure. Dulles is financially secure. So it is time to deal with the issue of allowing National to have more service to the western half of America. The people out west deserve to have more access to National Airport if that is where they choose to fly. I think that Dulles has uh, captured the international flights, and I think that has been a good uh, way for Dulles to become really one of our busiest airports and certainly one of our most successful. So I know these are difficult issues because I dealt with it in my own state, uh, but now I think this modest expansion of only five new flights uh, out of Reagan National should be very doable. I think that the Western Senators have come up with uh, a compromise with the conversions that will not affect the traffic or the congestion around National, but will allow better access, which I think is a win-win for everyone. So, Mr. President, and especially for you, Mr. President, with some huge humor, I find it a, a bit ironic that tomorrow is Groundhog Day. February 2nd. If ever there was a piece of legislation that fit the bill, this one is it. Since starting this legislation in 2007, 18 short-term extensions later, and this being the third consideration of the FAA bill on the floor, it does feel like Groundhog Day. In a nod to that holiday, that esteemed an important holiday in America, Let's hope that there are no shadows seen and winter will quickly end in a well-debated and bipartisan FAA bill. Mr. President, I thank the Senator from Michigan and the leader and the uh, Republican leader and my chairman uh, for allowing us to start the debate on this bill and finish our remarks. And I know we will have many amendments. I just hope in the end we have a good bill that does satisfy everyone's needs and that we can permanently say winter is over. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor.